Thank you so much. Well, I wanted to uh, start with a little fishing story. I had the great pleasure of catching my first trout on a fly rod on Saturday. And I don't know if any of you have had this uh, thrill, but it is not easily uh, earned. Fly fishing is uh, really hard. There's a lot of technique involved. And I'm used to sort of uh, kind of hack fishing where you just get it out there and you pull them in. Well, this is a finesse fishing where it's, there's this art, if you've ever seen the river runs through it, where there's this art of casting. Well, I spent uh, on Saturday eight hours on the current river casting without catching. And then at five o'clock, something took place that was amazing. It was called a hatch. There was a hatch of mosquitoes of some kind that actually matched the fly that I had on my line at that moment. <laughs> and literally, there were trout boiling the water of the current river. And as I began to cast, I realized that they were jumping out of the water to catch my fly. And I quickly caught two and was forever hooked on fly fishing uh, at that moment. Now, what you may have already discerned is that the, the rest of the day, or the, the, the eight hours before then, I had been so focused on the art of casting and getting that right that I wasn't paying attention to where the fish were swimming, and they were deep. They were sitting at the bottom, sort of content with whatever hatch happened during breakfast time, and thank you, and feeding on the bottom. And I think ministry can be very tempting to be a lot like that. Uh, as Richard mentioned, I have served as a pastor and now as a counselor. And too often, my temptation is to try to get it right and to not pay attention to deeper things that are going on in the hearts of those that I minister to or counsel to uh, and my own heart to kind of move past those things too quickly and to focus on sort of getting it right. When I first came here in, I think it was 94, I was very excited to have received a position uh, as a college director uh, at a local church. And we, my wife and I, recently married, came here. And on the day of my arrival, I got a phone call from my sister, who lives here, saying, that your pastor has just committed suicide this morning. And that was the beginning of my time serving there. Now, what was I feeling? Very confused. What do you mean he committed suicide? This was the man who had recommended me to take this job. He was a friend of my old pastor in, in Lawrence, Kansas. How could the one advocate, the one person who wanted me here, commit suicide? Um, as I began to minister to college students in that group, I would describe the feeling that I sort of picked up from most of them, and maybe much of the church was sort of a numbness. Uh, those of you who remember that time know that in the suicide note, the pastor had said something like, there are very few places that a pastor can go when he's clinically depressed. And so I connect those, the, the fishing story and that suicide story together in this way, that there are subterranean things going on in us that either we allow to be drawn up and, and really given to God, or they will catch up with us. And they will lead us to places in ministry that will be very self-destructive and very harmful to others even. I uh, work with a lot of men in the ministry I do, the work I do as a counselor now. Um, and I lead what are called anger healing groups. And I use this image from Rembrandt of the return of the prodigal. And it's on the brochures. And one night during the group, one of the men picked it up and said, 
You want to know who the really angry guy is in this picture? And I don't know how well you can see it. He's probably not even visible. But he's back here, if, if he's even visible to you in, in this image. He's probably not. Rembrandt brilliantly put him back in the shadows. And it's undoubtedly the older brother. Uh, these two here, these stewards perhaps, are, are much older than the prodigal. But there's a, there's a young face lurking in the back. And I think, you know, he's often called the older prodigal because he doesn't really bring humbly his anger to his father. And he doesn't expect his father's words to really minister to his anger. And so in a series of studies, really, that have developed out of this group, um, the first one called Uncovering Anger, I find that the first task, for me at least, and for many who approach this topic, is to realize that many of us are often like another figure in Scripture, Cain. For like um, the older who perhaps stuffed his anger for years, when Cain is engaged by God with his anger, he really doesn't want to open up. In this first mention of anger in Scripture, there is much speculation as to why God rejected Cain's offering. The text doesn't really say. It's one of these mysterious sort of things that's later explained that he didn't have faith in the way he offered. But all he knows is God didn't accept my offering. And that might be sort of how you feel when you're casting or doing ministry over and over again, and it doesn't seem to be coming back in a way that is, is evidently blessed. But he is asked a question. He's eventually asked by God, why are you angry? And what, why are you hiding your angry? Why are you angry and why is your face downcast? Uh, the Hebrew there is, why is your face hot, burning red? Why is your nose red, literally? And why are you turning down your face? Now, God knows the answer to both of those questions. But he's asking, as he asked Adam and Eve, where are you? So I want to interact with you now a little bit. Um, throughout this time, but to begin with this question, just a sh uh, by a show of hands and, and brief replies, name some things that make us angry. Why are we angry? What are some things? I'll, I'll prime the pump a little bit. Um, one might be feeling disrespected. That tends to be a really common one, especially for men um, in marriage or with their children. What are some others that you feel you know that these things kind of can make you angry. Traffic. Traffic. Okay. Can't get where I want to go. Injustice. Fr injustice. Good. Things are being overworked. So really just being worn out and feeling maybe like it's unfair. Maybe it is an injustice how much, I'm, how much work I'm getting. Others? Things are, things are going in ways that I did not want them to go. Lack of control. Okay. Any, one more? Okay. Well, fear. I'm afraid that if I, I'm afraid that something's going to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm using anger as a way to stay in control. That's a real common one as well. So this raises the question of what is the danger of hiding our anger from God? Uh, and I believe you know, one of the great dangers is that, uh, pointed out by a historian and philosopher, Rene Girard, that if we don't take our anger to God, we look for a scapegoat. Everywhere and always when humans cannot or dare not attack the object of their anger, they unconsciously look for substitutes. 
and most of the time they found one. Cain's substitute was his brother. He was really angry at God, wasn't he? Why won't you accept my offering? Why won't you bless me? And so by not going to God and really dealing with him in his anger, he looks for somebody else. And, and the, the reason for that is he can't essentially have community. Gerard goes on to say, we want community. We're made for community. And I can't live a life when my brother here is a reminder that God has not accepted me. So I, I need to, to take it out on him. I need to create a community where God is out of the picture. So if we don't deal with our anger that ultimately is raising questions about God, God, why did you allow this to happen in my life? Whether it's a divorce in my childhood of my parents, whether it's um, an affair that took place in my marriage, whether it's some betrayal in ministry by a supervisor. If we don't really deal with God about those, we will look for and find a scapegoat. And typically the scapegoats are the weak ones in the system. In a family, it's wives and children. In a church, it's pastors. The ones who depend the most on everybody else. So it's really important to know that if we avoid our anger, we will look for a scapegoat. Now, there's a, a very unexpected command that comes to us in Scripture to deal with this, and it comes from Ephesians, which you're all very familiar with. Be angry and do not sin. You know, the NIV says, in your anger, do not sin, but the ESV captures the two imperatives there. The first is be angry. Don't, don't lower your head with your anger, actually engage it. But engage it under God and do not sin. Why do we find this command unexpected or surprising? And now I think I'm primarily speaking um, from the culture of America, perhaps. Maybe it's true of, of those of you who are not from the States. But why is this command for American Christianity kind of surprising? Be angry. Yes. Okay, so that we are taught to turn the other cheek, we're taught to bear it, um, and, and in that there's not a sense of the priority of actually engaging the anger itself. That we move past it too quickly to turning the other cheek. And there seems to be a step missing in that. Um, any other thoughts of why this might be? <coughs> yes. It seems to conflict with you know, the idea of being more accepting OK. Yeah. Anger itself can, it, itself seems sinful as an emotion. How could I be accepting if I engage my anger? Seems like it'll make me judgmental. Okay? I think also that there's the opposite side where you can't hold me responsible for what I do because I was angry. So sometimes culture's message can be be angry and get even or find your own justice. Okay. And that, that desire to sort of be the one who brings justice can also lead us to fear anger. If I start to engage it, where will it stop? Yep. Kind of building off all three of those, just it's much, it, there's not a, an outlet for anger culturally that we're not used to using conflict as a tool. And anger is just kind of seen as this reaction instead of a, a kind of state of being. Good. So we're not, I'm, I'm just repeating things for the sake of the, the audio. We're not used to, um, we're not equipped with tools for conflict, I think is what you're saying, and seeing it as perhaps useful, the anger. Somebody else? Yes.
Good. So I, I find it hard to associate anger anything but with sin. Uh, it's associated with a really negative uh, use of anger immediately. That's a sinful. Let me, let me go with that into um, some of the roots of that in our culture that are really from the Stoics. Um, so here's a quote uh, from Plutarch. For as the shapes of persons seen through a fog, so things seen through the mist of rage appear greater than they are. So there's real truth in that. Anger, like fear, does distort our clarity in the ability for us, maybe in a ministry context, to actually see what is going on here. Okay? But he goes on, I think a bit too far, for the first way, my friend, to suppress anger, as you would a tyrant, is not to obey or yield to it when it commands us to speak loudly, to look fiercely, and to lash out. Again, that's, that's good. We're not to, you know, the, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. We can't just go with it. But to be quiet and not increase the passion as we do a disease by patient tossing and crying out. Um, so the only way it's really engaged in that sort of leaning to the intellectual away from the emotional side that the Stoics brought to us is it's a disease or a tyrant. Okay, and, and that's in many ways I think our heritage about anger, that this cannot lead to something good. And so we end up suppressing it. Um, let me ask for uh, some ideas how we would even define what anger is. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah. It's our response to a perceived wrong. Okay, good. It's a response to a perceived wrong. Okay. Anybody want to add to or say something different? Okay, um, here's uh, just from Webster, a strong passion or emotion excited by injury. Okay, there's the response. It's really strong and it's an emotion and it's excited or it's brought on by an injury. So here's a, a, a quick question. True, false, people cannot make you angry. You choose to be angry. How many would say, that is true. Okay. And the rest of you would say it's false. Is that right? How many would you say it's false? How many of you are willing to commit? How many of you are ambivalent about this right now? <laughs> so I, th I think I saw about two-thirds saying it's false. Um, I think it's really false. Why is it false? For those of you who raised your hand and are now committed to answering this question, why, why is it false? Because it's not something that I would want to use. I mean, it's being angry is an, an unpleasant emotion. And so it kind of rises up inside of me in spite of what I know is the right thing to do. OK, good. Um, boy, I don't, I, even though I don't want to, sometimes I get angry. Um, but is that just me choosing to get angry, or is there something deeper going on? Um, right here. Okay, we we can't just <laughs> we can't just turn that off. Um, our anger. Let's let's explore a little bit of why uh, the origins of anger. And I think there are essentially two. One is that we're made in God's image. Uh, we have God's holy character. And the second is we also have deceitful desires. Let's kind of break those down a little bit. Um, that our anger flows out of God's holy character. First, you just see us being made as image bearers. Now, when you read that, that text uh, in Genesis 1, you know what's in orange there interprets being an image bearer in relation to the creation. You're being made in our image, and now I want you to exercise dominion over the creation. 
I've just made this beautiful world, uh, including trout, and I want you to steward these. Okay? And so when things in that beautiful, good world are attacked by those who would want to destroy it, um, both God and his image bearers are incited to anger. Because something good has been created. And anger is an emotional response to a real or perceived threat or attack on what we consider good. Okay? And there's lots that's good in creation. So it is uh, kind of like fear in its best sense, in its uh, godly sense. It's an emotion that helps us to defend what's good or avoid what's bad. Okay? There's, there's good and right reasons to be angry and afraid. Now, um, which brings up the question, is God angry? And this um, psalm tells us that he is. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. What bothers us about an angry God? This is a very, um, I think, at the core question, especially in ministry, but also just out in our culture. Um, People lose elections because they are perceived to be too angry. Do you remember that with McCain and Obama in the debate? Um, I think one of the reasons we're not very comfortable with anger is we're not comfortable with the idea that God is angry. Why are we not comfortable with that? Yep. Okay. Good. So we're, we're not comfortable with the accountability of God. That, that's one reason. Can you think of others? I think we think that love and anger are incompatible. Um, and so if God is loving God, how can he also be angry all the time? Okay. So love and anger are incompatible. I want a loving God, not an angry God. What about our own experiences of anger? How does that play into it? Yeah. His, his anger is like ours, and it's unpredictable, fickle, and often misdirected. Great. Okay. Yeah, I think all that, you know, I'd rather have love than anger goes back to our experience of anger, which is kind of capricious, kind of unpredictable, sort of inexplicable. It just comes out of nowhere, and it does so much damage. Um, and I, I don't want an angry God. Um, so, but even in this psalm and in other places where God is described as angry, it's framed in his role as a righteous judge, not a God who is without a holy character in the way he is angry. It, over his enemies, God is angry as their just judge. You see this as he warns his people that they have essentially turned away from him and are about to invite his anger and fury for their idolatry in Ezekiel. But over his people whom he has redeemed, God is angry not simply as a judge, but as a loving father who's bent on disciplining those he loves. So you have constraint. In God's anger, you have the constraint of one who endures and waits with great patience till a time of judgment. Not someone who just reacts. Someone who sends prophets. Someone who sends apostles and, and tries to woo the, the sinner, but eventually acts as a just judge. But you also have him in what can feel like rejection, his discipline, a persistent father whose displeasure with us, or anger you might call it, is manifested in ways that are meant to draw us 
into, into humble submission to him. So God is angry in a holy way through roles and through law and love never being separated and ultimately brought together at the cross where both law and love are completely satisfied. So that's all to say our anger flows from God's holiness, but it also flows from our deceitful desires. If you look in Ephesians 4, we were taught to put off our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So back to the definition of anger, it is a defensive emotion when what we call good is threatened. The problem is what we call good is often not good. So I can get angry. You can make me angry if I have a vow that I am always need to, needing to be right. And so if you expose me as not being right, my pride and my valuing being right, you can actually make me angry. But I'm, you see where that's going? I'm defending the wrong thing. So part of the process of identifying with the question asked of Cain, why are you angry, is trying to discern what are we actually calling really good. So no matter what, our anger has these two sources. We can't dismiss it because we are image bearers and we are sensitive to the reality of sin. But we can't trust it completely because we are fallen image bearers. And so our anger must be questioned. Why am I angry? It has to be questioned. Now, first, uh, before it can be really questioned, we have to acknowledge that it's even there. And th this just brings us to the, the many faces of anger, just recognizing it, that it's, um, it's happening. Because sometimes we just have one image of anger, and there are a number. There's suppression. There's what we typically uh, identify as anger, which is open aggression. There's passive aggression. And then there's two that are really uh, essentially what God would have us to do with our anger, uh, a redemptive confrontation and forbearance. Let me just take those briefly one at a time. This, uh, the one who wants to suppress anger, is, this is kind of the stoic approach, says that anger is beneath me. If you've seen What About Bob?, this image captures suppressing anger really well. Uh, the psychiatrist is greeting the patient, played by Bill Murray, uh, with what seems to be a very firm handshake, seems to be listening, but the shadow conveys really what's happening, is that he's furious at him and he wants to kill him and eventually tries to in the movie. Okay, Suppressing anger, there's one point in that movie where he simply says, I'm not angry. I don't get angry. So he's made this vow to himself that it's not acceptable to get angry. And I'm just going to push it down. And it leads to um, either depression or open aggression. That anger suppressed either turns against ourselves or it eventually finds an outlet and turns against others. Most of this is probably very familiar to you, but just putting these categories in front of ourselves can often remind us of times that we're doing one or the other. Open aggression, life is a frightening war, so maintain control. If some of you are Lost fans, you may know Anna Lucia. This is a character who they encounter, the, you know, the first group of 40 encounters another group that's lost on the island. And essentially, she's the leader of this group, and she is driven by fear, not only from the present, but her own past, that she has got to stay in control. And so she is very aggressive with everybody she encounters. And it's back to that, what someone said often causes this is, is fear. It's the easiest to recognize, it's the loudest, 
but it can often uh, be simply being disrespectful of others, like being overly persuasive, not allowing others to contribute to a conversation. When we find ourselves doing that, oftentimes we're being aggressive. And then passive aggression says, don't get mad, instead build alliances. If you've seen Doubt, there's a scene in that movie where the priest is exposed by the principal on the far right there, and he builds an alliance with the young nun in the middle to try and turn the principal and turn public opinion back in his favor. So the passive aggressive person says, the one who gets angry first loses. So what I'm going to do is kind of withdraw, and, and I'm going to gain popularity. And I'm going to get even over time. Uh, redemptive confrontation says this, my brother is blinded by his sin. I must seek to restore him to God. This is Matthew 18. Um, that moves toward our offending brother or sister, respects the reality of shame that the confrontation will bring, so it's one-on-one, -on -one, um, but also is willing to really name what's happened. Now, the preparation for that is really the whole um, examining the beam before removing the speck, that I've got to identify with the kind of sin that I'm confronting, because the beam and the, and the sliver are made of the same wood. So I've got to really say, as I have been sinned against, that's really going on in my heart. And as I confess that, then I move toward that person, I'm much more ready to gently confront them with the hope that they, like me, need to be set free. And then just one more, and then I'll invite questions about this. Um, well, actually, here's a question about this. What keeps us from exercising this redemptive confrontation? Because we all know this is in Matthew 18. If you're here, you know that. Um, why, do, why do we not want to do this? And I think naming those kind of fears is, is really helpful in disarming them. Yeah? Just fear of conflict. Why do we avoid it? Yep. I think you just don't like being vulnerable. If you give someone the, the power to hurt, either if we forgive them or give someone power over us to be forgiven, there's a sense of openness, and we don't want to be offended again. We don't want to be angry again. We don't want to make ourselves vulnerable in that position. Yeah. If I open up, I'm setting myself up to be vulnerable again, you're saying? Yeah. Or we're period, vulnerable period. Just, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm in... I'm more in control, so I think, if I don't confront. But then, you know, back to looking for the scapegoat, eventually anger really takes on a life of its own. And, and we give control over to it over time, either through depression or uh, aggression. Because we are image bearers, and we have to settle something to restore some kind of community in our life. Other reasons? Yep. Fear of losing the relationship. Yeah, I might lose the relationship. What little I have right now, maybe I just want to preserve that. If I confront, I might lose what I have. So do we, this brings up the whole idea of not having hope, a redemptive hope for what God wants to do in this person's life but really having them for us more than for God, especially with parents. We need them too much, perhaps. And we're not willing to kind of put them in God's hands by speaking honestly with them about things. Okay, those are really, really good, good examples of why we avoid that. Um, the last one is forbearance. 
It just says, God is kind and patient with sinners like me. Um, hopefully this comes uh, both before and after what might be a, a confrontation, a redemptive confrontation. But it certainly can come after if, if that doesn't go well and is needed afterwards. Um, you know, it's the idea of bearing and suffering on behalf of another patiently over time with this hope that if I kindly and humbly wait, it will lead them to repentance. It's talked about in Romans. You have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges, which is the alternative to forbearance, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So there is a, there's a model for us in what God is doing, that as we forbear and continue with kindness, that idea of heaping coals, because the coals were symbols, the ashes on the head of those in the Old Testament, is I'm in mourning, I'm in repentance. I'm putting ashes on my head. And so when I'm kind to someone who has sinned against me, I'm heaping ashes and coals on their head. Now, they may, they may have a hard heart and resist it, but I can walk away knowing that I've done what I can to be at peace with that person. Um, okay. How do we learn forbearance? People are shaking their head. Any thoughts? It's sort of like not wanting to pray to God to make me more patient. That, I mean, that's essentially what, and, and the way to it is essentially to be disillusioned. And, and this is something um, that is really powerful as you walk through ministry. The, the gift that God can give you of being disillusioned. That suicide uh, of that pastor was really just the first of many disillusionments that, that God has given me over the years in ministry. Um, the most recent was losing a pastorate completely by a congregational vote and what felt like a betrayal by the elders. But as I look back on that, now three years in hindsight, I'm still beginning to get a picture of God meeting me and saying, you came with many dreams and visions of what ministry was going to be like. Um, but how often do our good intended visions get in the way of what God is really doing? Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about this in Life Together. And I'm going to kind of end with this quote from him. Just as surely as God desires to lead us to a knowledge of genuine Christian fellowship, so surely must we be overwhelmed by a great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we are fortunate, with ourselves. He goes on. By sheer grace, God will not permit us to live even for a brief period in a dream world. He does not abandon us to those rapturous experiences and lofty moods that come over us like a dream. God is not a God of the emotions, but the God of truth. Only that fellowship which faces such disillusionment with all its unhappy and ugly aspects begins to be what it should be in God's sight, begins to grasp in faith the promise that is given to it. What began with um, the suicide here continues for me, and I hope it continues for you as well, that the disillusionment may well be part of the loving Father's discipline 
in our lives. And what we want to associate with a capricious judge and sort of stuff in anger against God, we need to really begin to bring before him and and allow him to ask, why are you angry? How are you angry? This is uh, just a beginning of a journey for many. I'm going to give a handout to you that you can take with you. Um, And it's just some questions for further reflection, and there's some uh, reading materials on here as well. Um, It's part of a a longer series that tries to look at these topics. Um, This is what the groups uh, deal with. And they're basically out of a, a study called an essay on anger that was done in 1809 by a Puritan named John Fawcett. And they're just topical studies in scripture. Um, so let me pause there and invite questions on just this, this topic of anger and uh, uncovering it.